Well, good evening. I'm glad you're here tonight to take a look at Romans chapter 6. Um, we looked at Romans chapter 6 on Sunday a bit, and I told you we'd be going through the chapter this evening, so I'm glad you're here for that. It'll be a good one. Before we get going, let's stop and pray. Lord, we thank you for bringing us to this point. We thank you for carrying us and keeping us safe and healing us. We know that there are some missing even tonight who would really like to be here, but they are ill. And we lift them to you and we pray for healing both now and eternal. And, um, and we pray, Lord, that you'd hold us close and that you'd keep us moving closer to you. And that we would be ready and excited about your next coming. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Romans chapter 6. I came across a little quote from Tim Keller this week. You might know who he is. He was the founding pastor of a big church in New York City, Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And he wrote a, a few books, like or maybe like a few books a day for quite a while. And there's quite a few uh, of his out there. He's a, he's a smart guy and he has lots of good stuff to say. And I try to keep up with him sometimes when I can. And he said to pastors, he said, Christian communicators must show that we remember or at least understand very well what it's like to not believe. Well, that makes sense. We need to show that we understand what it's like to not believe. I mean, that makes sense for anything. If you uh, get a new employee down at your store and you need to teach them to mop, well, you need to show them that you understand what it's like to not know how to mop if they're going to listen to you. You know, you got to start at the beginning. you got to deal with the questions and the objections as they come without shying away from them because you understand what it's like to, to not understand. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here in Romans chapter 6. He's identifying with the one that has some questions. Romans chapter 6 and on into Romans chapter 7. He, of course, has told us that um, even though all have sinned, all lack the glory of God, even though all have chosen to worship and serve the created thing instead of the creator, that God has provided salvation. Even though we all chose to step out of the beauty that he provided and in so doing incited him to righteous wrath, we were hurting his children and he had every right to lash out against us. Even in that, God provided such tremendous grace that brought us our justification and our redemption, and propitiation, and forgiveness, and as we're getting into now, our sanctification, that God has made it possible for us to be reconciled to him. The, um, the interesting thing that we learned that we talked about a few weeks back that I find just so fascinating is that God chooses to save not the almost righteous, he chooses to save the complete sinner. He always goes for the biggest loser. It's not the one that was born into the proper family that has the proper uh, credentials and the right pedigree and understands the rules and is doing their best to follow them. Or the one who claims to be right and externally at least looks right. It's not even the one who says, I understand there's a God. And I don't care about that. I'm going to do my own thing because I'm just fine by myself. God chooses to save the one that says, I am um, incapable, a worthless, filthy sinner. I can't get up on my own. God says, no, there's somebody I can do something with. That's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritually bankrupt. They're the ones that inherit the kingdom. They come with absolutely nothing. That's why he told the rich young ruler, there's this one thing you lack. The thing you lack is all the stuff you own and how good you think you are. Those are the problems. You got to come empty. Those are the ones that God chooses to save. Probably has something to do with the fact that God saves only by faith. It's not of works, lest we should boast. In other words, if we could do it on our own, then we would. And then we'd worship ourselves. 
I mean, that's what got us into this mess in the beginning was this concept that somehow we can just handle it on our own. You know, I, I think a lot about the problem for Eve and Adam there in the garden. And, and the problem really was that they just didn't take God at his word. God said, I got all this great stuff for you. I got some neat stuff to do. It's going to be absolutely wonderful. And, and don't mess with this one tree. You can sit in it. You can sit under it. You can think it's nice looking. But if you eat the fruit, you'll die because the fruit is poisonous. I'm not sure what the purpose of that tree was, but it was a good purpose. Not a negative purpose, because God said everything is good. So it was good. And the fact that they shouldn't eat it was good. God said so. But they, they just didn't take him at his word. They said, you know, based on my understanding and experience... Based on my scientific analysis, on my experience here in the garden of all of my years, my understanding of biochemistry and, and uh, botany and all of these other things, it will be just fine for me to eat the fruit. I will not surely die. They just didn't take him at his word. And since they didn't take him at his word, they became poisoned and have passed that poison on to us. Now God says, listen, you have another chance to take me at my word. I have told you that I have offered you justification. Salvation, redemption, propitiation, reconciliation and forgiveness. And that I am offering you sanctification and it leads to eternal life. Oh, okay, well, what do we have to do for that? Well, God says, just take me at my word. That's what got you into this mess, not taking me at my word, now taking me at my word. You know, and it strikes me that it's the same on, on so many things, everything that we get involved in in life. I mean, if you trace back the mistakes that you've made in your life that have put you into a bad spot that you might even still be paying for now, if you trace them back, you'll find out that in every one of those cases, what it really boils down to is you just didn't take him at his word. I mean, that's always been the way it is for me. I just, you know, I just didn't take him at his word. Or I thought, well, God probably didn't say anything about this. Well, he did. It's in here. But I knew if I would have looked for it, I wouldn't have liked what was in there. So I just chose to ignore it. Huh. So now we take him at his word and we receive salvation and so much more. Our outline to this point, of course, we had the introduction which was just the first 15 verses, and then the thesis statement, which was chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And then we got into the status of the sinner, which took us from 118 to 320. The status of the heathen, the hypocrite, the Hebrew, and the whole of humanity. And then, of course, the salvation of the sinner. The lost one gets saved, and that is from 321 to 331. And then, in chapter 4, verse 1, we find out that the sinner has become a, sta a saint, that positionally before God, the one that was the biggest loser is now the Holy One. Hagios, word that means Holy One, and we say saint. From chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, 21. It's not, a saint is not one that is properly venerated by the church so that we can put the ST in front of their name. A saint is not one that we feel like, uh, just, you know, well, my grandmother, she was a saint. No, a saint is anyone who comes to God with faith to be saved. He says, you are my holy ones, separated, pulled out, and different. So chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, 21, tells us that the sinner has become a saint. And then from chapter 6 through 8, which is where we are now in our outline, we call that the sanctification of the saint. Sanctification, it's a term that means a dedication or a setting apart to sanctify something is the process of making something useful only for this one item, or this one purpose, I should say. I'll give you an example. I bought a really awesome toolbox. Oh, gosh, what's it been? Maybe two, three weeks ago at Harbor Freight? It was expensive. It got a good sale, but it was still really expensive. It is, honestly, I, I'm not, I, I, am, I, I kid you not, it is the nicest toolbox I personally have ever purchased. 
It's on wheels. It's about this high. It's got, I don't know, eight or ten drawers. They are really, you know, my tool, my nicest toolbox out in the garage, you grab the drawers, they wiggle, you know. This one, no. It's just their perfect slide. It's a heavier gauge of steel, and it's a really neat color. It's like a really neat color of blue, not the typical red toolbox or black. I mean, it's, it is the nicest toolbox I have ever purchased. Now, that toolbox will never go in the garage. I got it for Wendy. She's got all of these kitchen gadgets, you know, that she uses to, to make me food. All these, I mean, there's, I, did you, do you know how many different kinds of whisks there are? I'm still learning. Anyway, and she needed a better way of storing them. And, of course, cabinetry is very expensive. But a toolbox is perfect because she can roll it around. It's got a wooden top. It's perfect. So I bought her the nicest toolbox that I could afford that would do the job. And she went through and organized it, and it's really nice. Now, I want you to know that that toolbox has gone through the process of sanctification. When we got it home, Hayden was like, woohoo, a toolbox! And I was like, no. We are setting this aside only for your mother's use. And as we began to put it together and do the things, I thought, man, this would fit so nicely in this one spot in my garage. Nope. We have set it aside only for your mother's use. And we cleaned it all up and we got it all ready and we brought it into the garage, into the garage, into the kitchen and she started putting stuff in it because it is sanctified. It has been set apart only for her. Now, sanctification for us takes longer than sanctification took for this toolbox. It took us about an hour to get it into the kitchen where it belonged from the time we got it home. Sanctification for us takes a lifetime. From the moment we determine we are going to follow Christ and we begin the process of surrendering ourselves to Him, it, it's a continual activity, a continual process of sanctification that sometimes goes in real leaps and sometimes goes in real creeps. And we're all creeps, so I guess it works in us. And this section introduces to us the sanctification of the saint. Now, I want you to understand something. Sanctification is by faith. It's taking God at his word. You know, I, I got into the Church of the Nazarene about 16 years old, and sanctification was something they talked about often, and they often brought up um, various physical or supernatural experiences that a person might have. And there was almost this expectation that you must experience this thing to be being sanctified. But sanctification is something that comes by faith, not by experience. If it came by experience, I could pursue the experience, and when I've achieved the experience, I've now sanctified myself. And then who am I worshiping? Once again. Now, I'm not saying that there are not experiences that come along the way. What I am saying is that sanctification is something that you receive from God by faith. He comes to you and says, I want you to surrender this portion of your life to me. And we say, okay, God, I surrender it to you. Um, but I've got to admit, God, I really don't feel any different. That's okay. Sanctification is by faith. God has said, I have taken you into my own. I've taken that part of your life to myself. That part of your heart now belongs to me. Okay, God, I believe it. It's yours. I believe it. You say it, I believe it. It's by faith. Hebrews tells us without faith it's impossible to please God because we have to have the faith that he exists and that he's doing what he said he would do. Well, this is the faith that he exists and is doing what he said he would do. And this is what Paul is about to tell us about here in chapter 6 through 8. Now, this section, we're going we're gonna to try to get through chapter 6 tonight, but I can already tell we won't. We're going to try to get through chapter 6 tonight, but we're not going to get into chapter 7. And this section that we're working on will take us through chapter 7, verse 6. It's really three examples that Paul gives, or three analogies that Paul uses to answer two big questions. And I introduced these two questions on Sunday. Question number one is in verse 1. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace might multiply? And question number two, what then? Should we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And 
And, and you've got to translate those into American to really understand what he's saying. Question number one, should we continue in sin so that grace might multiply? In other words, since God has supplied enough grace to forgive us of everything we've ever done, everything we might be doing, and everything that we'll ever do in the future, since God has provided enough grace for all of that, why can't we just continue to do what we want? Why can't we just continue to do the activities and behaviors that came from sin? That's question number one. And question number two, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Where there are no more rules when you are a Christian. Do this, don't do that. Touch this, don't touch that. Those rules don't have anything to do with your salvation. You have been saved by grace through faith, not by works. So apparently works don't matter. So since rules don't matter to me, why can't I just do whatever I want? Paul's asking those questions because Paul knows what it's like to not be saved. And those are questions he had to deal with. And they're questions that are completely illogical. Paul is appealing to logic in this section. But, um, but they're questions we're going to ask. And they're questions that have to do with behavior. You've got to be really careful when you start talking about sanctification and when you start talking about rules of law and when you start talking about behaving in a particular way because you can really easily, as a, as a person, slide into legalism. These are the right things to do as a righteous Christian, and these are the wrong things to do as an unrighteous Christian, and so if I, which doesn't exist. And so if I do the right things, then I'm being righteous, but if I do the wrong things, I'm being unrighteous. That's not what Paul is talking about here. You remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. They were not concerned about hygiene. And they weren't concerned about eating with dirty hands or hands with some kind of filth on them. They were concerned about eating with hands that were not ceremonially clean. You see, the, the Jews with their dietary systems had gotten to the point that you might have touched something that was ceremonially unclean throughout the course of the day. Perhaps an insect that was ceremonially unclean or something a Gentile had touched or something like that. So before you eat, you would not wash your hands to make them clean. You would wash your hands to make them ceremonially pure. There was a system they developed of how you put water on one hand and wash the other hand with it and all this other kind of stuff. Once again, not for hygiene, but so that if you had gotten something ceremonially unclean on you, that it could be removed. Otherwise, if you have something ceremonially unclean on your hand and you pick up something and eat it, well, that ceremonial uncleanliness uh, uh, moves to the item you ate, and now you're ceremonially unclean on the inside. So why are your disciples going around eating with unwashed hands? Jesus said, listen, it's not the stuff that comes from the outside in that makes you unclean. It's what's in the heart that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of you because it was in your heart. That's the kind of behavior we're talking about here with Paul. Paul's not talking about a list of rules, and as you become sanctified, you're going to follow the rules better. That's not what he's talking about. And that the longer you walk with Christ, the more rules you follow. That, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that your heart should be changed when you come to Christ. When you are born again, born from above, born anew. You're a new person. Your heart should be changed. And if your heart is changed, well then most certainly the behaviors that you choose are going to be different. I'm not talking about instinct. I'm talking about chosen behavior. The things you choose to do and be involved in are going to be different because the motivations in your heart are different. Does that make sense? That's what Paul's talking about here. So, chapter 6, verse 1. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace might multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I, I really like there's that little section, are you unaware? It would better translate perhaps, do you know? It uses the gnosis term, the knowledge term. Paul appeals to the people's knowledge. What is it that you know? We're dealing with logic here. What do you know is the truth? What you know is that when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, 
in order that, just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. That's what baptism is all about. When we come to get into the water, we are coming as the old person. As we are put into the water, it's as though the old person were being killed with Christ. Down in the water, it's as though we've been buried with Christ. Coming up out of the water, it's as though we have been resurrected with Christ into a whole new person. The statement we make in baptism is that we're starting brand new with Christ. Paul goes on and explains just a little bit more. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of our resurrection, of his resurrection, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who's died is freed from sin. And that's a big chunk right there. There's something that we have to take by faith in that section before we really get to the rest of it. And the thing that we have to take by faith is that our selfish human nature was crucified with Christ. We're told that he who had no sin became sin for us. So we have to, we have to just simply take it by faith that that the selfish human nature that we have when we come to Christ and surrender ourselves to him and say, I want to live for you, I want to follow you, that the selfish human nature that we once had has been taken by Christ up onto the cross and killed. The term in my Bible is that it was rendered powerless. We talked about this at length on Sunday, and it's not the idea that it was killed and is dead and is never coming back. It's the idea more that it was paralyzed that the old selfish nature was paralyzed. I told you a story on Sunday about a friend of John Corson, well, not really a friend, a bully of John Corson, who got paralyzed in an accident and was a bully no more. Little Johnny was no longer afraid of him. He could do nothing. He could just sit there and yell. He could just sit there and say, you got to do this, you got to do that. But, but John didn't have to listen to him because he's powerless now. That's the concept here. That the old you, at one time, Paul has explained it very clearly. At one time, we had no choice. When the selfish nature cried out, please me and appease me, we just had to do it. We didn't have a choice. But now, we have a choice. The selfish nature is powerless. It can say, please me and appease me, and now we can say, no, I'm not going to. Because I have been crucified with Christ. This is what Jesus is talking about. Deny yourself and take up the cross. Say, no, that's not me anymore. That has died. And then come and follow him. That's what he's talking about here. And a person who has died, verse 7, is freed from sin. I got to tell you, Wendy's going to hate this part. I am just the littlest, okay, I'm just the littlest bit, je- littlest bit jealous of Chris, who has died. My good friend, I I tell you what, we had a lot of fun over the last four years since we got here. We came for interview and Chris said, oh, or no, we came to move here right away. And Chris said, I I live a half mile up the road. If you need anything, let me know. And from that moment on, we were swapping tools. And you know somebody's your good friend, guys, if you're swapping tools with them. That's when you know you've got a good friend. And, And I really enjoyed getting to know him. And I got to know him well enough to know that when Maureen called me and told me that, that he was in cardiac arrest and not coming out, th- I got to be honest with you, one of my first thoughts was, he beat me. He is freed. He is freed. He doesn't, he doesn't struggle with any of this stuff anymore. None of this stuff that you and I struggle with on a regular basis every day doesn't struggle with any of it. He is completely and totally freed. He has accomplished sanctification. Well, he hasn't, but Christ has accomplished that in him. Wow, that is just, can you imagine? It's just incredible. Oh, we'll talk about that later when we get to 622. Absolutely incredible. The person who died has been freed from not just the power of sin over their own life, but the effects of sin in their life and all around them. This This whole world going down. 
They have been freed from that. That's fantastic. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. Verse 9. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, he was very different than before he was crucified. So different, in fact, that many who knew him before didn't recognize him. He was very different. He was not bound by the rules of the order of this world. He could do whatever he wanted. He was freed from it. And he was unrecognizable. He just, you know what? You go back and look. Everybody who saw him resurrected, or worshipped him. One way or another, everybody who saw him acknowledged that they saw the glory of God in him. Not so before. People argued with him before. Resurrected. Oh, there were some who struggled and didn't understand. But when they saw him, they saw the glory of God in him. I think, I think what Paul is telling us just a little bit here is, when we are dead to sin, we will begin to become like that. Where people see us resurrected and they just don't necessarily recognize us anymore. Oh, I'm not saying we maybe look physically different. Maybe we don't look physically different at all. But there is something so different about us that they say that person is a whole other person. You know what it really looks like, they might say, is that that person has become free. And I see something different in them. And that thing that they see would be the glory of God. Since we died with him, we can also live with him. For the death he died, verse 10, he died to sin once for all time. You can refer back to 5, 12 through 21 uh, for Paul's uh, logical argument on that. The death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. That's what is expected of us. The death we die, we die once for all time. We don't keep going back to it. It's rendered powerless. It's done. Now, the life we live, we live for God. So, verse 11, consider yourself or reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You just reckon it. That's an accounting term, and that's really the closest word to the original word that we still use. You reckon it. You get out that spreadsheet, and you you move yourself from the category dead to sin to the category alive in Christ, and it's done. You reckon it. Wait a minute, you say, I don't feel any different. I have surrendered my life to Christ. I believe, because God has said it, that I'm freed from the power of sin. Still hear that old man just bellering back there. But I have reckoned on my accounting sheet that I am now no longer dead to sin. I am now alive in Christ. But that old man is still yelling, and I'm still facing the struggles of the day, and I don't feel any different. Let me tell you something about accounting. Accounting doesn't change the bank account. Did you know that? You send somebody a bill, your company. You send somebody a bill. You say, you got to... You got to pay this bill. And, and it's in, the, it's in the, the column of owed. They owe you this. And then they call you up and they're saying, well, I'm paying this bill. And so you move it on the sheet from owed to paid. You ain't got no money in your bank account. They just tell you they're going to pay it. It goes into a category that, that you might know of as accounts receivable. Before it was just a debt, but now it's accounts receivable. They've got a certain amount of time to get you that money, right? Accounts receivable. Did you know that the bank considers accounts receivable an asset? Seriously, seriously. If my company does some work for you, and now you owe me $10,000, and I've got it, th they're going to owe me $10,000, and so I send them a bill, and you get the bill, and, and you're going to pay the bill, and I move that $10,000 from money I spent to money you now owe me. It's in my accounts receivable. I can go to the bank and say, I'd like a loan, and they say, what do you have for collateral? And I say, this person owes me $10,000, and they say, that's good collateral. 
accounts receivable is considered an asset. It's something that your company holds as wealth. Let me tell you, when you reckon yourself alive in Christ, that's an asset. Now, have you received full payment? Chris has. Have you received full payment? No. But you have it. By faith, it is an asset. You have been sanctified. You are dead to sin. You are alive in Christ. The old man no longer has any power over you. You are free from that. You have that asset now. The life of Christ in you. Oh, but I don't feel any different. Reckon it. It is done. Further, Paul says... Do not, verse 12, therefore, as a result of this reckoning, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. That old man, don't let him be in charge. No. And don't offer any parts of it to sin. The word there, we might say, yield or surrender or present. The old man says, hey, take your hand and do this. Okay, well, here's my hand. No. Don't present any parts of your body. Oh, look at that thing. Read that deal. No, I'm not presenting my eyes to sin. Oh, listen to this. I'm not presenting my ears to that. Oh, say this about this one person. I'm not presenting my mouth for that. I'm not going to do it. Don't present any parts of your body as weapons for unrighteousness. Isn't that cool? As weapons for unrighteousness that would fight unrighteously. But as those who are alive from the dead... Offer yourselves to God, present yourselves, yield yourself to God, and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. You know, there's a a saying that for every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament story. And I kind of hurried through this section because I really want to tell you the Old Testament story that that acts as as a description or analogy or a picture for this section. It's a really good story. And it just describes it so well. I I thought about not telling you, but it's just too good. It's in Judges chapter 4. It's the story of a woman named Deborah and a man named Barak. Well, it's really not their story. It's more the story of a woman named Jael and a man named Sisera. See, here's what happened. You can look it up back there in Judges chapter 4. It's a true story of what really happened to the Israelites many years ago in northern Israel. The people were rebelling against God, and so God didn't protect them. He told them that's what would happen. And there was a king by the name of Jabin, who was a Canaanite king, who had an army commander named Sisera. Sisera had 900 iron chariots. That would be like like a, like a, a little country that has nothing but 22 rifles having to fight against another country that has a whole fleet of F-22s. Well, the Canaanite group had 900 iron chariots, and the Israelites had 10,000 soldiers with sticks and rocks, not making it up, that's what they had. So Jabin ruled over them. And Jabin apparently was a pretty vicious overlord. And his army commander, Sisera, apparently wasn't a very nice guy. He was essentially a slave master over the Israelites, this guy Sisera. Well, Deborah was judging Israel at the time, and Barak, who was her army commander, came and said that that they needed to do something about it, and, and Deborah prayed about it and said, well, God said, go lead the army, and he'll deliver them. And he said, I'm not going without you. That's a whole little side story that's really good to read there in Judges 4. So Deborah and Barak together go and lead the army, And they go and meet up with their 10,000 guys with rocks and sticks. They go and meet up against Sisera's vast army with the iron chariots. And they beat him. Their 10,000 guys with rocks and sticks beat Sisera's vast army. To the point that Sisera, the leader, the commander, bails out of his chariot and takes off on the run from these Israelites. That's what God did for him. Sisera runs along until he finds the tent of a man by the name of Eber, who is a Kenite. Now, Eber is not his proper name. Eber is the word Hebrew. It doesn't mean that he was ethnically a Hebrew. The term Hebrew, which has come to be an ethnic term, 
literally means one who crosses over. You know, Abraham crossed over from the world to God's kingdom. That's how Abraham became a Hebrew. You can read about it in Genesis 14. Abraham became a Hebrew the day that he met up with Melchizedek, and he left behind the world for the things of God. Well, this guy, Kenite, he's a Canaanite, but not anymore. He has crossed over. He's not in Canaanite land. He is in Israelite land. The implication there is he had been a Canaanite under Jabin. We see there in the story that, that, that he, had, he had been serving a subject of Jabin. He had been subject to Sisera and Sisera's overlordship in Canaan. And he said, enough of that. I'm going to cross over. I'm going to go live with the Israelites, which means I'm going to serve their Yahweh God. I believe that he's real God, and I'm going to him for freedom. Eber the Kenite. Now, Eber the Kenite's not actually in this story. Where is Eber the Kenite? Probably with the Israelite army, fighting on behalf of Israel. He left his wife at home, though, a lady named Jael. Now, Jael, whose name means Yahweh is God, Jael is there in the tent. Sisera is fleeing on foot from the army of the Israelites, running hard as he can, running a marathon. He sees the tent, he sees the colors of the tent, and he says, oh, I know that family. They used to serve me. I know they served me well. I know that family. And so he came to the door of the tent, and there's Jael. And he says to Jael, might you have just a little water for me? Now hold on, let me tell you what's going on here. I told you this story, which was a true story, serves as an analogy, as a picture of what's happening here in Romans chapter 6. Eber the Kenite, Jael his wife, have had enough of the things of the world. Canaan always represents the unrighteousness of the world. They have had enough of the unrighteousness of the world. They want to come to the freedom of Yahweh God. They leave behind their old master, Jabin. They leave behind their old overlord, Sisera. They leave them behind. Not going to serve them anymore. I'm going to go serve Yahweh God. They physically move. They cross over into Israelite territory and begin to serve Yahweh God there. And then one day, the old master shows up. Can you see the picture? This is a picture of us. We have said, I'm done with the things of the world, and I'm going over to God for freedom. He will deliver me. I'm going to him for freedom. And then one day, the old master shows up. The old overlord, what Paul calls the old man, the carnal nature, shows up. And it it shows up very sweetly. I'm dying here. Can you please just give me some water? We tend to listen to that. Because the overlord shows up when nobody else is around. I mean, here's Jael all by herself. There's a war going on, and she's in a tent by herself. I mean, she's got to be feeling a bit threatened and scared. Her husband is not around. There's armies fighting. That's when the overlord shows up when we are alone, when we are tired, when we are scared, or for some, when we are with our best friends and feeling good and being encouraged, whenever that, whatever that moment is where you are at your weakest, the old master says, just a, just a little cup of water. I, I, I'm dying here. You've got to help me out. I, I, really, I really need the attention. And we say, you know what? I really do need the attention. I've been working so hard. I've been doing all this stuff and nobody cares. I really do need the attention. Now, Jael has a decision to make. If she gets a cup of water for this man, which will require her leaving her house, going to wherever their water source is, creek or whatever, obtaining the water and bringing it back to give to this man. If she does that, she once again becomes his servant. Can you see that? 
She once again is enslaved to him. She is telling him, just like the old times, you are my master. You have told me you want water. I will bring water. She's not just being nice. She is enslaving herself to him once again. She has a decision to make. Here's what she decided to do. She said, I will not, I will not get you water. And she made a quick plan. She said, instead... I've got some milk. It's warm milk, probably in an animal skin. It's probably a little bit curdled. That's how they kept milk in those days. He's been running in the heat of the day from battle and is very thirsty. Have you ever been like, like genuinely thirsty and drank warm milk? It doesn't work. Yeah, it, my mic's like, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. What does it do? It shuts him up. It shuts Sisera up. So she says, listen, I've got this. This will shut you up. And she gives him some milk. Now, Sisera hasn't gotten the idea. Sisera says, good. She's back in my clutches. She is my servant. And Sisera says to her, I'm going to come into your tent. Jael never invites him in. He says, I'm going to come into your tent, and I'm going to hide over here and, 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 and cover me with a blanket. And when the men come by looking for me, the other soldiers, you tell them that, that I'm not here. To begin with, so sweetly, I just need a cup of water. Now commanding, I'm in charge here, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to lie for me, and you're going to protect me. Because that's how the old man works, you see. To begin with, oh, oh, I've been working so hard. I just need, I just need this, just, just, this, just this one little thing. It, it's, it's not a big deal. No big deal. And then as soon as you give in to it, all right, now, fine, this is how we're going to do this now. And this is what Sisera tries to do to J.L. So she says, okay. And she lets him lie down, and she covers him with a rug, a very heavy rug, and he begins to fall asleep. And she says to herself, I've about had enough of this. I moved from Canaan to this place to be away from this guy. He is a horrible overlord and a wicked taskmaster, and I will not serve him anymore. And she goes over to the corner of her tent, and she grabs a tent peg. These were not these little bitty ones like you get with tents now. I'm sure these were big, either stone or iron, big, heavy tent pegs. She grabs a tent peg and sneaks up on him very quietly while he's sleeping. I would have thought she would use, use the tent peg to maybe bash him, but no, she takes that thing and sets it in the temple of his forehead and she takes a hammer and drives it through his forehead. And I love it in Judges, it says, and there he died. <laughs> you think? And then she left the tent and went out and stood in the entrance to the tent and waited for the soldiers to come by. And as the soldiers come by, she says, you who soldiers, I'll show you who you're looking for. And she opened the door for Barak, the commander, and there's Sisera, dead on the ground of her tent. She would not serve him again. That's a picture of what Paul is talking about right here. That we, like Eber the Kenite, have said, I've had enough of the world. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not serving that stuff anymore. I want out of that. And we have packed up and left. And come over to, well, really, a foreign land. We've come over to the kingdom of God where we can serve him. We have denied ourselves that civil term, that military term. We have changed our citizenship from the nation of me to the nation of him. We have come over where we once were a king. We now bow before him. We have denied ourselves. We have come over to this. And now that we're here, the old man has come calling. Well, just, just, just a little drink of water. I don't have my iron chariot anymore. I'm powerless before you. Just a little drink of water. I told you on Sunday, the easiest way to kill a paralyzed person. I did. I, I know it, it sounds really bad, but I did. It's just don't feed them. They can't feed themselves. Paralyzed from the neck down, they can't feed themselves. It doesn't require any violence. It doesn't require any struggle. It doesn't require any pre-planning. You just don't feed them. 
the old man lies paralyzed, calling out from his bed, oh, oh just feed me just a little bit. And, and if we give in to it and feed him, he says, good, now how about some more? Okay, and we feed him, and he says, good, now I require more. And he becomes stronger, and his voice becomes louder. But if we don't feed him, he just fades off. Here comes Sisera, the old man once again, and J.L. says, you know what, I've had enough. I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this struggle. I've had enough of putting up th- with this. I am going to reckon, I am going to, in the accounting term, reckon that he is dead and I am alive to freedom. <laughs> and then she actually killed him too. Because it's in Judges, and that's what you find in Judges. Lots of good stories like that. That is the example that Paul has, has called upon. That's the, the analogy, the story that shows us how this works. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, he says in verse 12, so that you obey its desires. That's the thing you left behind. Oh, I've been forgiven of all this sin. I've been forgiven of everything I'll ever do. I can just do whatever I want. No, Paul says. No, that's ludicrous. That's ridiculous, he says. Don't do that. You left that behind. The whole point was that you left that behind. Now, he says, now, he says, don't offer any parts of it uh, uh, to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For, he says in verse 14, sin will not rule over you, Because you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin cannot rule over you. You are free from it. Now, moving on. What should we say then? Should we say that, or should we sin because we're not under the law, but we're under grace? Since those rules don't matter anymore, the rules of sin, should we just do whatever we want? Once again, Paul says, absolutely not ludicrous he refers once again back to his same line of logic and reasoning and gives us his second example his first example baptism his second example now slavery don't you know verse 16 that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves you are slaves to the one you obey either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness don't you understand that if you offer yourself to someone as a slave then you're their slave? And I thought you left behind the slavery of sin. So if you decide you want to pursue sin, this is more than just listening to the old man and responding. This is, you know what? I think I'm going to do this thing. You've decided to pursue sin. Don't you realize that you are once again a slave to sin? Paul builds this entire argument on the concept that everybody works for somebody. That everybody serves somebody. That's an argument that we don't like so much in our Western society because we like to think we're free and we don't serve anybody, but we do. Everybody serves somebody, whether that's on your job. Oh, I'm self-employed. Well, then you serve your customers. Everybody serves somebody. And in those days, it was much more clear that everybody served somebody because of the whole Roman caste system and how it worked with, with so many slaves that were... Slaves was a, a social class, not, not like we think of as slaves. I mean, yeah, they were owned by a master, but there were all different levels of slavery even. Uh, Dr. Luke was a slave, is his social class. So he says, y- you can understand this. Matter of fact, at one point at, um, in verse 18, he says, I'm using a human analogy. In other words, this analogy's got holes in it. It's the best I'm going to be able to do. This is the best I can use to describe it to you. If you show up, he says, at somebody's door and knock on their door and say, I want to be your slave and serve you, then you are their slave. So, he says, you have been set free from sin, it's now dead. If you decide, hey, I'm going to go serve sin again, then you just become its slave again. What is the other option? What else can you serve besides sin? Obedience leading to righteousness. You can serve God, he says. Those are your options. I really enjoy that quote by Wesley. I've told it to you many times that he, uh, where he talks about how at one point 
He determined that all of his life, and not some only, must be surrendered over to God because any part of his life that he kept for himself, that he was deciding he was going to serve himself, was actually, in essence, service to the devil. That if he was not actively serving God with every part of his life, that if he was serving anything else, that he was therefore serving the devil. Makes perfect sense. Paul's drawing on that concept here. Should you decide to serve sin, well, then you're a slave to sin. Should you decide to serve God, well, then you're essentially in slavery, if you will, to God. Concept that we really struggle with, so let's keep going. Verse 17, But thank God that, although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. Um, I have a, an analogy that, or a uh, translation that makes a little more sense to me. Thanks be to God that though you were once slaves of sin, you became obedient out of the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. You were once slaves of sin, but thank you to God that you became obedient from the heart, like we talked about earlier, not Obedient in the mind and the actions and the flesh, but obedient in the heart to what? To a list of rules and regulations? No, to a form of teaching to which you were committed. Not which was committed to you, not which was given to you, but which you were given to. In other words, Paul says, I taught you the gospel message. I taught you what God has to say. And you took what God has to say into your mind and believed it by faith and let it soak into your heart. You became committed to it. It wasn't committed to you. You're not in charge of it. It is in charge of you, you see. You allowed this teaching to become your master. You allowed the word of God to become your master in your heart. You are committed to it now. And as a result, you're obedient to it. Does that make sense? So instead of saying, I'm going to go do this thing. I've decided I'm going to do this thing. I'm committing myself to do this thing. Instead, what's happening is we're being committed to the Word of God. And so now the Word of God calls the shots. And so now we're obedient to it. But not as a list of rules. You weren't committed to a list of rules that now you must follow. You're committed to the teaching of God which is grace and peace to you from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. You've committed yourself to that. It's soaked into your mind. It's soaked down into your heart. And now that it's in your heart, you are obeying what your heart desires. He says. Does that make sense at all? I hope so. Okay. Because I'm not sure that I'm speaking it clearly. It's probably a lot easier to just read in there. Thanks be to God that although you used to be slave to sin... You obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over, and having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. You were free to now do what's right. I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh, verse 19. For just as you once offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness which results in sanctification. Same thing, do it differently. You once became more and more selfish, sought more and more after the things of the flesh. Now, simply seek more and more the things of the Spirit in your heart. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. That's kind of funny. You had absolutely no obligation to do anything good. You were completely free to pursue yourself as much as you wanted. Didn't matter what got destroyed and who got stepped on in the process. You were completely free from that. You didn't have to worry about that at all. But now, he says, or pardon me, so what fruit was produced, verse 21, from the things you're now ashamed of? So during that time when you were just pursuing yourself, doing whatever you wanted to do and not worried about anything else, how'd that work out for you? Now you're ashamed of it. Oh, I I can identify with that when I think about the times that I just pursued only what I wanted and didn't really care about anybody else, very ashamed of those times, very ashamed of what was produced. And as he said, the outcome of those things is death. Not a single thing that was produced in my life by searching after myself and trying to satisfy myself 
ever led to any kind of positivity. Always led to death. But now, verse 22, one of my very favorite ber- ver- uh, verses in the book, but now since you have been set free from sin and have instead become enslaved to God, you have your fruit. What is the fruit? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Lindsay knows. Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. I missed one, self-control, because I stopped to talk to you. That's right. You have your fruit, which results in sanctification, that setting aside, that becoming more and more of his until one day we are completely and entirely his. And the outcome of that sanctification is eternal life. Being completely free from all of it forever. Complete satisfaction. Because, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Sin is a taskmaster. Do this. Stand there and tell those people when they come by. Sisera said to J.L., do this. Sin is a taskmaster. But sin pays. In that, sin is a very fair taskmaster. It always pays properly. And what you earn for sinning is death. I have told you before, I, I, I always get amazed when people say, well, I just want what I deserve. Do you really? Let's talk for a minute about what you deserve. What you deserve is death. But the gift of God, not earnable, you can't earn a gift. If you earn a gift, it's not a gift. I remember all these people, yeah, when I was at uh, elementary school, I'm getting the newest transformer for Christmas. So how do you know that? Oh yeah, I'm getting the Optimus Prime. How do you know that? Well, my mom told me if I got good grades in this class, that's what she was getting me for Christmas. Okay, that's not a gift. That's an earned reward. A little over the top for good grades. I never got an Optimus Prime. And I had pretty good grades back then. I mean, it's a little over the top, but it's an earned reward. God said, this is not an earned reward. This is a gift. Remember, it's by faith. It's not something you can do. It's just something you accept. When somebody gives you a gift, you don't immediately say, well, what did I do to earn this? You simply, by faith, accept the fact that they just got this for you, that they just wanted to be generous with this and supply this to you. Wendy did not ask me when I came home with her toolbox, what do I have to make for you now? To make all these cakes? Oh, is this because I I didn't do a good enough job on one of the things I made last week? Am I expected to in some way earn this thing? No. She just said, man, that is the coolest toolbox I have ever seen. I don't know if she said that or not. I'm making that up. But she said something to that effect. She said, man, that is just great. Thank you so much. And then she told me, you don't have to buy me anything for Christmas, but I know she was lying about that. Because, yeah, because I'm smarter than that. Mike understands. That's right. She just accepted it as a gift. She just accepted it as a gift. She took it on faith that I wasn't expecting anything out of that. I was expecting nothing in return. Just giving her a gift. The gift of God that we receive on faith, that we put onto our accounting sheet in accounts receivable. Oh, we haven't received it yet, but it's an asset. We know it's there. It's bankable. The gift of God is that eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. That's chapter 6. I'm so thankful that I managed to get through it in one setting. Even though we went pretty fast. I did talk at more at length on that, on some of that on Sunday. As well as giving you some very practical ways. Some very practical ways to put to use what is here in chapter 6. And, and so much of it is just simply being still. You always have the option to do nothing. And when that old man says, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. No, you don't. Well, but this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Okay. You always have the option to simply stand. So take a look at, uh, online at uh, last Sunday if you want some more information on chapter 6. And uh, this week will be, this Sunday we'll be getting into chapter 7. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this freedom. 
that you have supplied so much. We thank you that you have given us the capability to simply trust you and to reckon the fact that you have dealt with the carnal nature and to just take it by faith that we don't have to do that stuff anymore, that we have a different heart now. And we pray, Lord, that others would see uh, those who've known us before and see the process that you are doing in us and want that for themselves. We thank you, Lord. Amen.